Kathleen Sexton. She's the program manager over at the Clinton River Watershed Council. Great to see you again. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Happy New Year to you also. I learned so much the last time um, we talked about the Clinton River Watershed Council on the show. But for those that maybe missed that episode, give us a little bit of background about what you actually do. Sure. So the Clinton River Watershed Council, we are a nonprofit organization. Our office is based in Rochester Hills, but we have a pretty large service area. We cover 760 square miles in Southeast Michigan. So everything within the watershed boundary. So a watershed is essentially just an area of land where all of the water resources in that specific area drain to a common body of water. So we're talking about the Clinton River, its tributaries and Lake St. Clair. So we work to protect, enhance, and celebrate the Clinton River, its watershed, and Lake St. Clair. I was, you answered so many of my questions already. I was about to say, what is a watershed? <laughs> and you're, okay. uh, so it's great, you know, because there are so many people out there. We don't understand exactly uh, the boundaries. Like if I live in um, Kiko Harbor, why should I care about this? So Kiko Harbor has a lot of water resources. We've got Cass Lake, Sylvan Lake, Dollar Lake, um, and even Oakland County and Macomb County and in general, because we have lots of Oakland, Macomb County within our watershed, as well as parts of um, St. Clair, Lapeer, and Wayne County. So like I said, it's a pretty big service area, but in Michigan in general, we have so many freshwater resources and we want to know um, how we protect them, how we restore them, and then what we can do ourselves in order to be part of that restoration process. So what is the biggest threat that you're concerned about right now, Kathleen? So right now, the biggest thing that affects the water quality in the Clinton River is stormwater pollution, which it's kind of a hard issue to tackle because it's a collective issue. It's a result of everybody's individual behaviors. So when it rains or when snow melts and that water runs across roads or driveways or roofs, it picks up everything um, that's on those surfaces. So right now we can imagine there's a lot of road salt in that runoff, there's litter in that runoff, oil and grease, things like that. And it ends up in our rivers and streams untreated because they go into the storm drains. They're not treated at a waste, that, that water is not treated at a wastewater treatment plant before it hits the river. So if we can keep those uh, pollutants out, it helps keep our streams a lot healthier and cleaner. But how do we do that? So we have several different programs that we can educate homeowners on what they can do at home. So things like green infrastructure, you can add a rain garden, which a rain garden sounds, it sounds confusing, but it's essentially just mimicking a wetland. So adding a couple of plants, you know, digging a little bit, a little bowl, adding some plants at home um, that'll help absorb some of that stormwater, making sure that you're taking good care of your vehicle, making sure that you're maybe getting some elbow grease out there and you know shoveling the snow instead of salting the ground you know things that you can remove manually first um, instead of using chemicals or salt um, when you're fertilizing in the spring or the fall being aware of reading the package making sure that you're um, applying fertilizer with uh, in accordance with the directions and not over fertilizing because anything that's excess will end up uh, washing off into the river so there really are a lot of little steps that everyone can do to protect yeah. our environment and we just don't think about it. Right, because we have one and a half million people living within the watershed. So if even you know just half of those people made small steps at home, it really would make a big difference collectively. So if someone wants to get involved in your program, do you, are you guys taking volunteers right now with COVID and the pandemic going on? We are doing um, some volunteer events. We actually have an event coming up this weekend. Um, everything is outdoors, socially distanced with a mask. And we also have some programs that are virtual right now. So the, the event that's coming up this weekend is called Stonefly Search. So tell us more about that. What is so, a stonefly? <laughs> so I guess we could start there, huh? <laughs> yeah, we could start there. Um, a stonefly is a small aquatic insect. Um, and there's two species that actually emerge in the winter to avoid predation. Um, they're just like a mosquito or a regular fly. So they start their life cycle in the water and then they eventually emerge and become a flying insect. Stoneflies are very sensitive to pollution, which means that they are a good indicator of water quality. So we get volunteers, we train them how to collect them. We train them on how to identify them and record the data. And they go out all across the watershed. We've got about 75 people going out 
Um, they look for stoneflies. They come back and tell us what we found with our data sheets. And then we've been collecting that data for almost 20 years now. So it really helps us keep an eye on the watershed, if there's any changes, improvements, things like that. And what have you been able to discover from this over the 20 years? Well, I mean, we're actually coming up to our 50th anniversary this year. At the end of the year, we're going to be celebrating that. So, I mean, 50 years ago, you wouldn't be able to find fish in certain parts of the river. And now it's a really popular fishing spot. Um, there's all kinds of life. Lake St. Clair is really popular for bass fishing and things like that. And stoneflies are a very significant food source for fish. So when we find more stoneflies, it supports the ecosystem. We've got clean water and it helps support fish populations and other uh, wildlife populations. It really is fascinating to think about how nature works together. And it yeah. is a full circle. Do you think during the pandemic, we know that so many more people were getting, they were taking advantage of our backyards and our, you know, our streams, our rivers, our lakes and our trails. Do you think that that's going to have a long lasting um, positive impact on our environment because people are enjoying it more? I would hope so. And I, I think that yes, it will. I think that part of what we do is we educate people about, you know, the things that are happening, like the water quality issues, but we also educate people about what's good. So part of our mission is celebration. So we celebrate these water resources and we try to develop a sense of appreciation and stewardship. So people are excited that, that we have all these resources to get outside these, um, these public lands, um, the rivers and streams and lakes. And hopefully if they are using them and appreciating them, they'll also want to take care of them. So uh, the Watershed is a nonprofit. How do you guys um, get your funding? Is it through government agencies or is it donations? So it's a variety, both of those that you just mentioned. So we, we do have some stormwater and government memberships. We work with communities in order to provide education services to their constituents that live in their community. We also um, get grants from community foundations. We also apply for grants from the state or federal organizations. Um, but donations are and memberships are a big part of it too. So if people want to get involved either by volunteering or becoming a member, they can go to our website. It's crwc.org. Or you can sign up for our newsletter. So um, any opportunities that are coming up for education, volunteering, or becoming a member, you'll get updates about that there. Kathleen Sexton with us here on the Mega Cast. She's the program manager for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Uh, Kathleen, you you seem you appear to be so young, but you're so knowledgeable. How did you get into this? I would say that my uh, sense of wanting to take care of nature and the environment and things like that really was instilled when I was a young kid. I remember playing a lot outside. I remember being curious about, you know, wildlife and water and how everything worked. And, um, you know, just different things in my life that point, pointed me in this direction. I got my undergraduate degree in natural resources management. Um, I had a few different positions that kind of steered me to where I wanted to be. And I was lucky enough to, you know, be able to work for this amazing organization that's close to where I grew up. Um, so it's really come full circle for me, but I would say a lot of the stem from, you know, when I was a kid and playing outside and, and hearing about in the nineties, the big buzzword was acid rain, you know, so what is that and why is it bad? And, and it just continued from there. But when I'm thinking about the public, it's easy to get people behind supporting like panda bears or giraffes or some of these other um, cute animals. And not yeah. that the stone fly isn't cute, but really, I mean, how do you get people excited um, to support what the work that you're doing? So that is a good point because I, I do have some pictures of the stone flies. They aren't, um, they aren't particularly cute looking, but um, I see this a lot when we work with our high school and middle school students too. They're kind of like, ooh, those are gross or, oh, that looks weird. And you just get them excited about, oh, this is science. You're able to do some science. You're helping us collect this data. Um, and it's actually pretty cool. And then they kind of come around to that like, wow, it is kind of cool. And I think it's also um, empowering people to do their own science. So citizen science, that's what it's about. It's about educating just regular citizens um, about how they can do this and how they can be a part of collecting this data. 
And then especially when they come back every year and see how it's changed or see how it's getting better. Um, I think that's really important to get people involved and, and get people um, engaged and sort of bought into the mission. Uh, you know, it, it, it is sad though, what's happening uh, in our environment in so many different places as well, especially when you see uh, the amount of trash that's in our oceans. And, you know, even now it's like you go out and you see people throwing their gloves down still or their face mask still almost daily. I'm still seeing a mask. Um, you know, in the, in the driveway or, you know, in the parking lot or something of that nature. And so do you, are you hopeful that our environment is going to survive or do you also get discouraged because you're doing all of this work and there people are still disrespecting mother nature? Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, I, I am hopeful. I do think that there's certain people that just, they, they, decided to litter and they're, they're going to continue to do that. But there's a lot of people that can change. And I try to stay away from the doom and gloom messaging. It's always like, oh, this is bad or the environment's bad. But, you know, 50 years ago, the river was in really bad shape and it's it's improved so much now. And I fully believe that 50 years from now, it'll be better than where it is today. Yeah. I mean, look at the Rouge River. Yeah. You know, there are parts in Detroit, you, like you wouldn't even want to put your finger in there. And yeah. now you can fish in it. The fish are returning to the, you know, Rouge River and Detroit. Yeah. Who would ever have thought that even 10, 15 years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we work closely with Friends of the Rouge. They're uh, other watershed group. Um, they've been doing a lot of great things. They've got a paddling trail. They've got a rain garden program. So lots of opportunities in that in that area, too. Um, we do work closely with other watershed groups because watershed boundaries um, are dictated by, you know, geography and geological features, but municipal boundaries are not. So, for example, West Bloomfield is in a very um, unique area because it has parts of the Rouge River watershed, the Clinton River watershed, and the Huron River watershed, all within one township. Wow. So with that, if someone wants to get involved or if they want to volunteer, how can they do that? Like I said, you guys can uh, go to our website, www.crwc.org, and we have all of our events and volunteer opportunities listed there. You're also welcome to sign up for our newsletter. And um, there's maps so you can see which watershed you're in. So if you're not necessarily in the Clinton, but you want to get involved, you're still welcome to volunteer with us. Or you can check out um, the Rouge River Watershed or the Huron River Watershed Council. They also have um, similar programs and opportunities as well. So are you able to share those um, pictures with us of the stonefly? Yeah. I can share you share some pictures of the stonefly with you guys right now. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the morphology and and what we look for and how to identify them. So um, they are a little interesting looking. If you look, the biggest identifier for a stonefly is the two tails and then their triangular thorax here. And then if you look over on this side of the screen, this is a dragonfly larvae. So dragonfly also spend most of their life cycle in the water and they, they're much larger. So you can see that the, the winter stoneflies that we look for are pretty small. Um, they're tiny little insects, but they, they make a big impact and they indicate clean water. So that's why we like to find them. So can you see them with the naked eye or do you need like a net to be able to go in and fish and try to find them? So we do take a net, we take a D net, we put it on the bottom of the river, you're in waders. I've got some pictures of some volunteers and waders. Let's see if I can pull it up. Yep, so this is pictures of volunteers actually getting in the river and collecting the bugs. We put them in the bins. You can see them with the naked eye, um, but we have a, a field microscope which just micro or magnifies about 10 times and that can help you see it, them a little more close up. I will say uh, kudos to the volunteers because it's not warm <laughs> this time of year, you know? Yeah, I think it was two years ago. We went out when it was about five degrees. So, and everybody was still willing to do it. They were excited. You just, you, we bundled up and once you had the water in your bins, you had to look very quick, quickly for the bugs before it froze. <laughs> so it, you definitely want some hand warmers and some tote warmers. Yes. Absolutely. And some brave people that are willing to put on the waders and get in the river. Uh, Kathleen uh, Sexton with us here. She's the program manager for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Kathleen, before we let you go, anything else maybe I didn't touch on that you want to share? Yeah, absolutely. I will share one thing. Um, today, we are going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. 
And we actually um, were established in December of 1971. So we're going to be starting promoting that this spring. And then a lot of our events that are surrounding our 50th anniversary fundraising events, um, outdoor events are going to be happening towards the later part of the year. But stay tuned. If you haven't heard of us before, this year is a great time to get involved. And we'd love to have more support and more volunteers. So when we talk about the volunteers, I noticed in the pictures, it appeared they were mostly adults. Do you allow kids to volunteer as well? We do. This is a family friendly event. So um, kids of all ages are welcome. Same thing with our cleanups. We have our weekly clean program that'll be starting back in uh, early April. So family friendly event. These pictures are, I think, from last year in January. So before pre pandemic. We are requiring masks. We are requiring social distancing from anybody outside of your household, but they are outdoor events. So relatively safe when it comes to uh, the pandemic and things like that. Well, Kathleen, it's been great to uh, have you on the show. I always learn so much um, when you guys come on. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.